So, hey, I'm Maida. Um, I'm a Gala developer that worked on converting the VGen driver, which is a DRM driver, to Rust. And in this presentation, I have the intention uh, to introduce you guys to Rust Gem and also to explore some problems that I have encountered during this journey. Um, I separated a good amount of time so that we could discuss about like 10 minutes, just like Danielle, that we could discuss um, the challenges that we have, that we see the DRM, to see the DRM abstractions to be extreme, and hopefully we can come up with insightful ideas moving towards. So, um, what's the VGen driver first? VGen stands for Virtual Gem Provider. So it's a virtual DRM driver. Um, Gem, for those who are not familiar with the graphics subsystem, Gem stands for Graphics uh, Execution Manager, and it is a memory uh, management framework that we use in the DRM subsystem for handling uh, graphics memory efficiently. Um, so it is a hardware agnostic um, driver with no strings attached to any vendor, just like Danilo, the, Danielle brought the idea, uh, is a virtual driver. It was written in C uh, and introduced in the kernel in 2015. And it's a fairly small driver uh, with about 400 lines in C. Uh, it provides a gem service. As I told you guys, gem is graphics execution manager and only two IOCTOs, uh, one to attach the fences and the other to signal the fences. And the use case uh, is when we don't have a real GPU available and we can create setups using TMU and LLVM pipe. It can be quite useful when there is no real GPU and the graphic workloads have to go through LLVM pipe. So VGEM is a fairly compact driver. Why are we rewriting it? I mean, it could end in the same question that Dave asked us, like, why are we rewriting a driver? So rewriting VGEN was a proof of concept. The idea of converting a GPU driver to Rust was trying to answer in questions like, how suitable is Rust for the DRM? And are advantages in uh, using Rust to write DRM drivers? And this is, um, answering these questions is even more easy when we have an example to compare to. I mean, we have the C example. We can, you know, compare to, understand, you know, it was easier, did we prevent uh, memory issues? Because while I was rewriting VGM, for example, I could find um, some memory issues, uh, like user to free issues in the VGM driver. So we can compare to and see, you know, those differences. Moreover, VGEN is a GPU agnostic driver, so we can really focus on the DRM framework and how to write the safe abstractions. Uh, we, don't have, we don't need to face any issues uh, regarding hardware specifications or like weird firmware or things like that. Uh, VGEN really relies on the DRM infrastructure. So by using VGEN, we are making use um, of many aspects of the DRM infrastructure. So we are basically, you know, by using the DRM abstractions, we are testing the whole DRM infrastructure via Rust. And VGen is a fairly compact driver, so it would be a small project with very tangible goals. And finally, as I just told you guys, uh, VGen uses a lot of the DRM framework, so it's a great opportunity to explore um, the DRM bindings and see if they match the requirements of different drivers. As I'm going to tell you guys, I use Asahi's Linux bindings, and like using a Linux bindings in other driver proves that you know they are not unique to Asahi. They can be used for the many different purposes in the DRM subsystem. So the result of this idea was RustGen. Um, RustGen is a driver written in Rust that has the exactly same functionality as VGen. Um, it didn't introduce anything new. I even used the same UAPI as VGen. You know, they have exactly the same IOCTOs, the same functionality. Um, I wrote RustGen using Asahi Linux DRM bindings and also some Rust for Linux bindings, especially um, the timer abstraction. 
Um, and using the DRM bindings was really a, a really natural experience. I mean, uh, even for a Rust beginner like me, it was really easy to use them, but it was a bit difficult to find some of the Rust for Linux bindings. Um, they can be out of three, just like Andreas mentioned, a bunch of them that are out of three right now. But I must say that the community was really communicative and pointed me to the right resources. So I would really, really like to thank. Can, can, can I ask a quick, quick question? Uh, because you said timer, so I'm curious. Uh, is that the HR timer as well or a different no, timer? No, it's, uh, it's an abstraction for um, his abstraction. <laughs> oh, 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 okay, okay, cool. Uh, uh, cool, but that, that's what I mean, like we need um, more, <laughs> um, what do you say, Vis visibility in like yeah. who did what and where is it and stuff. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, it's some, mm. uh, I mean, by talking with the community, we can really find the bindings. I mean, he really, he pointed me like, oh, I have the abstraction. Mm. But at that point, I have already wrote an abstraction, although it was a wrong abstraction. Uh, <laughs> uh, he pointed me to a much better abstraction. And, you know, I would really like to thank for all the Rust for Linux folks that are very communicative in Zulip. Uh, I would like to thank all the folks that interacted with me when I was uh, writing the driver. It was really nice. And so, thanks. Uh, beyond the DRM bindings, I also wrote some bindings um, for legacy platform initialization because uh, Vigen is a virtual driver. So, um, we don't have that like hot pullable um, thing that we have in real drivers for to for with platform devices. So not hot pluggable devices like VGen or VKMS need legacy platform initialization. So I wrote bindings for that. And I also wrote bindings for DMA reservation objects. And I part from the bindings, I wrote the driver itself. Um, you can access the code uh, that I developed uh in the link in the slides and finally i would like to share with you guys some of the challenges that i have encountered during this process so here i must say that i'm going to give the perspective of a c programmer like oh, probably the answers to these questions might sound really obvious for like experienced rust developers but i would like us to document use this space to document these ideas you know um, for a future reference. My first challenge in dealing with Rust in the kernel environment is managing unsafe code. Like for me, like beginning in Rust for Linux, it looked like a loophole, the fact that we need unsafe code to write the safe abstractions. Because the whole point of moving from C to Rust was to avoid trusting on people um, to write safe code. And here we are again, like trusting on people to write safe code. And by the end of the process, of course, I could understand that now we are minimizing uh, the amount of unsafe code that we have in the kernel. So it's a win after all. But we still have, in a smaller amount, the problem of trusting on people, which means that we need safety review. And from what I could see, like uh, the Rust for Linux folks are really engaged in you know, safety review. You know, you guys are like very experienced Rust developers. So you are like making your best to review like every Rust patch re related patch. But sometimes not the subsystem reviewers are that engaged in um, safety review. So the first question that I would like to raise to you guys is how can we uh, encourage safety review inside the subsystems? Because this can be a problem in the future because um, sometimes the Rust for Linux folks don't have the expertise needed. You know, do we, you guys are very experienced developers, but sometimes you don't really understand the concepts of uh, a very specific subsystem because the kernel is huge. So how can we engage those like old school C developers to properly review Rust code? Because I mean, to just read Rust, I mean, we are programmers, we know how to read things in many languages. But to see the subtleties of the languages sometimes is not that easy. So it's something that I would like us to think about, you know, to... Do you want that we discuss one by one or later? We can discuss later. I just, okay. I 
uh, gathered all the questions in the final slides, so we can discuss later. Uh, and uh, this brings me also to a second question, like can a beginner uh, spot subtle safety issues in the code? Like I can say for myself that I wasn't. Um, this is a code snippet in the slides. This is a code snippet um, of a code that I submitted in the VGEN RFC. And this small code snippet has an issue, although it has a safety comment. And it has a safety comment because I thought it was safe. <laughs> But it wasn't. Like Bjorn pointed to me during the review process, there is nothing ensuring that DMA reserve doesn't outlive self and thus may be, may be deallocated. So, you know, although I thought this code was safe, it was not that safe. So I believe that we need to think um, about approaches to make sure that Rust in the kernel is accessible for beginners but not to the point that they might be introducing safety issues in the kernel. And a second challenge for me was how to write good abstractions. I mean, there are a couple of specific patterns that are used when writing safe abstractions that I wasn't familiar with, at least. And the mentorship session that I linked on the slide that Miguel gave, uh, it's a very good resource. Um, but I believe that we can do even more. I thought that what about writing more documentation about writing safe abstractions? I mean, sometimes we don't even need to write very formal documentation. We can write like a blog post documenting the process of uh, writing an ab abstraction. Um, like just a, sometimes a, a that, like a journal, something like that. This way we can build more knowledge uh, about safe abstractions, improve safety review because we are building more um, content about safe to about uh, safe abstractions and bring more people on board with us. And finally, a more technical question: um, How can we make macro expansion easier? I mean, for example, uh, I had these two macros in the VGen View API that I had to turn into enums so that they could be solvable by BingGen. And you know, this is not ideal. I would like just to use the, my macros, you know, does, don't touch on the UAPI would be ideal for me. So I would like to raise these questions to the Rust experts in the room, like, could we make this more like easier? Uh, maybe something in BingGen, you know? And Apart from my technical challenges, I would like to bring a more broader discussion. At the moment, in the DRM, we have the DRM bindings like that were written by Asahilina. Uh, we have two almost upstreamable drivers in the DRM. We have Asahi and we have RustGen. What could help us to upstream Rust for DRM? Like, are we lacking reviewers? Um, are the maintainers not willing to maintain the DRM bindings? We don't want Rust in the DRM. Uh, what is missing? What is the next step um, that we could need to take uh, to move into this direction? And like, if we finally take the next step, it means that everybody is responsible for it. This means that we cannot have C only developers in the DRM. Like, nor we can have Rust-only developers uh, in the DRM. It means that everybody's responsible for it. So if I'm going to touch on C code that affects Rust, I need to be responsible for the Rust code as well, not the, only the C code. It's my problem as well. well. I mean, we are a community. So this also means that um, people writing the, the, the Rust bindings might need to touch on C code. And it's not reasonable to expect that a Rust, a Rust developer will be able to guarantee all safety requirements without touching on the C code. I mean, sometimes you need to, uh, for example, Daniel pointed that um, they have some lifetime problems in the C side, right? So how he's going to just solve these lifetime problems in the Rust side without touching on the C side? It's not possible. So we can even see the bright side of this. I mean, a uh, Rust developer will be working to the, make the C code even safer. So 
I mean, it's great for all of us. So if you want to see things moving forward, I believe that we need to learn how to compromise between those two sides. And this way, we are going to have the well-documented benefits of Rust uh, spreading around multiple subsystems. So I just gathered all the questions that I raised during this talk. I believe that we have like 15, 10 minutes that we could now discuss. I would like us especially to focus on the boat question because, I mean, as I told you guys, we have the DRM abstractions, we have drivers, what is missing? Um, I have absolutely no problem with putting Rust drivers in the DRM. I'm perfectly happy that we put Rust drivers up as many as possible in the DRM. I have, <laughs> I'm fully behind this effort. Um, I'm not a Rust expert. I, I can read it, barely. But yeah, to upstream this, right? I, the Asahi thing has hit a bit of a roadblock, and that's a, a problem I'm sorting through now. I'm trying to assign engineers to work on that, and that's a lifetimes issue at the scheduler level. That's really messy lifetimes. The lifetimes in C are already all over the place, so uh, we're, we're, we will get that solved. This driver, I don't really see anything stopping it other than somebody with Rust saying that, that those abstractions are safe, and yeah, and we should just try and get it in the tree. I don't mind having two copies of something in my tree. I don't mind getting rid of the VGEM if this is in any way better, even in any axis. VGEM is not a driver we really care about. So it's like, yeah, this is better. We'll kill it. Like it's not. So, yeah, I am fully supportive. Do whatever we, you know. If someone's blocking you, come to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I shall resolve it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely want it. Rustgen would be like a pretty nice idea to, you know, start because Rustgen doesn't require all the Asahi Linux abstractions. Yeah, so. so we can like um, pick a couple of them, you know, start to make the upstream and, you know, start to integrate uh, into... I'm, like, I'm also good with carrying a bit of dead code for a release, two releases. Like, I understand there's going to be some non-DRM abstractions we have to upstream. I'm also willing to help if they need velocity and pushing because, yeah, like I can merge stuff through my tree. I don't really care, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> just, just want to comment on the reviews uh, from C maintainers. Um, you know, I posed the same question as well, uh, and it seemed like the answer made perfect sense to me. And they, they told me, you know, I don't, I don't need to trust that your uh, Rust code is going to be right the first time. I need to trust that you'll be there to fix it. And that's it. Uh, okay, I try to answer the first two uh, questions. So, uh, I uh, as Benno said in the chat that Benno is already working on something uh, like a safety like standard for like all the safety uh, comments. So, uh, in the future, you may not just put a safety comment saying, "Hey, I believe this is safe." You cannot do that. You must have like a reasoning about that and uh, there will be uh, some kind of criteria for you to uh, you know to think about it before you put on a safety comment and also when you expose something unsafe then you will also think that I you know how to require a user to prove prove that there are some cer some certain like safety condition is is meet for this function for the use to be safe okay so that is uh, uh, working in progress. Uh, there's something working in progress. Yeah, but I believe that this connects to the first question, like how can we document the process of the thinking about the safety safety review? Because you know, I I got uh, I put some reasoning uh, into all my safety reviews, but I mean, I'm a human. I make mistakes. I mean, uh, I'm a not that experienced developer. So how can we maybe create more documentation on, a, you know, how to analyze if so, it takes common? So, so the purpose of the, uh, like the safety, uh, the, the documentation that Benno is working on, and also I'm working on something called a uh, uh, reverse recommendation, is to give people's like handbook, like handbook they can follow on to do the review. Oh, so that they can, nice. oh, this is something I need to check. But, like obviously, like we may like when people use that at handbook, still could be something could be missed. So we will need to keep to improve that. But uh, this is something we try to like provide to everyone, so that uh, you don't need to be 
like have all, you know, you can do that on your own. Okay? Like you have, have some certainty about that, you know, the safety of uh, your API or your abstraction. But I want to mention that. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I just I'm, wanted yeah, to. <laughs> okay, so I just I just wanted to to talk a bit about what what I'm I'm working on there. Um, the thing is, uh, it's it's very difficult to to have both humanly easy understandable safety documentation and uh, still rigorous definitions that uh, you cannot misinterpret. And um, as you said, you you still can have mistakes in there, and I think that's just. Where we where we have to rely on review as as the C side also does, and I think the important thing for us to to notice is that uh, the the unsafe code that we have is similar has the the, the same vulnerabilities or essentially uh, the the code itself has the the same problems as as the C code as well where we have to catch things in review, but um, with the safety comments we can ensure that if you if you read it like uh, like like more, more or less like a formal system then then you can ensure that it's correct by uh, just following some some certain logical rules there and in in your case um the the important thing is that the the safety documentation of of the function that that you had there would have required that you pay attention to the lifetime of the object it would say that you would also have to ensure that the the object that you create from there lives as long as or, or the reference that you put into there lives at least as long as the, the thing that you get out i just wonder what we value in also sort of documenting the bad things the anti-patterns that like if you spot sql that looks like this well you're not going to make it into rust you need to fix sql like getting that sort of thing out there yeah yeah we're trying to get that thing out but you know like object in kernel are like they're like various of object in kernel some of the object have this attribute some of the of that has that attribute so we uh we, right now we only allow to upstream the abstraction that have a really user so i what the idea is that we can do like more abstraction work so that we can learn that oh this is like a certain thing have the, the, the certain python but uh we're going to learn it one by one, like learn it. So, uh, so we are going. So it's going to be a learning process. But we are trying to like make something that you know our, our, everybody is easy to follow. At least to make sure that there is no obvious no one issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um. Uh, if nobody else wants to speak, I think the the just to address the, the thing you said about m macro expansion. Yeah. I think that's a known binding bug. So if yeah. you look for issue seven thirty one, it was fixed. It wasn't. There was, somebody commented on it today by coincidence, but I don't think it was fixed. So the answer for your question, I think, is no. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I thought uh, I knew that it wasn't fixed. But I, I would like us to, you know, I mean, there are a couple of Rust experts in the room. They might have some idea. It's It's been three years. I don't think it's... So, yeah, you are the Rust expert <laughs> What? You are the, look, the Rust expert that I was looking for. Oh, no, not me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, these changes by where we use the enum instead of define, you know, maybe we should just upstream those even if they come before the Rust code that needs it, right? Right. I, I mean, maybe that's reasonable enough to do that in the C code anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's kind of, it's reasonable, but you know, maybe um, someone could say that ah, we are touching on the C code. I mean, you shouldn't be touching on the C code. So, so one comment, so it's not, I, I don't think it's, a, it's considered a bug because basically a feature is missing. They, they, don't, they don't go into the macros. As, as soon as it's not, it's not trivial, they bail out and that's it. Okay, so they want to potentially have solutions for that. They want to increase. I know that the binding maintainers are interested in uh, expanding more of those. So basically, the idea would be to at least get to the ones that expand to a, to a constant, right? So at least handle those, right? And it would be very nice for us. Now, on, on the, but I have a few comments on the, on the uh, other questions as well. Uh, on touching the seaside. Uh, in the beginning, it's true that we were trying when we when we 
we're out of three and we were trying to show how 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 rust would work in the kernel we were trying hard to not touch any seaside code in order to precisely show that it could work even in that case now talking to maintainers and talking to uh, uh, the seaside maintainers and and, and and so on in the last year we have seen that they are willing to improve things on the seaside uh, if that makes things easier on the rust side at least some of those right and that's very nice because then we it opens the door to other solutions. I mean, not just in this bind and thing, but in other many other design uh, things that you could you can actually make the thing easier on the right side uh, if you can at least have some flexibility on changing the seaside. Um, another thing on the so the safety review, I think, uh, well, what you uh, covered that is uh, what I wanted to stress is that as, as Ben was saying, this is something that we have in the seaside. Is that, that so basically the question is hey we have a uh, nice comments there that explain why it is okay uh, in the seaside sometimes we don't even have those and the problem that we are have having now is hey can we formalize those to make it even easier to review or automate some of those reviews so basically we are trying to solve uh problems that we create for themselves when we try to do things uh, uh how to say more documented or more properly but of course we 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 may we can make mistakes there uh, uh at least right now we don't have a formal tool that can verify the safety comments. Uh, but it's exactly the same thing as in the, in the seaside. So it's, it's an improvement. We want to, what we believe is that it's an improvement over C already, even if we didn't have anything else than the safety comments right now. That could be could be mistaken, you see. Um, more things, uh, I think, well, they've answered the upstreaming. Uh, and how can I encourage safety review inside the subsystem? Now, what's something I comment that uh, they've said? Um, that's why I was saying that before that we really need the maintainers to learn Rust to some degree because there are many things and, and you were pointing out, hey, the Rust people is doing, well, Rust for Linux people is doing uh, cities uh, abstractions, but really what, what we were doing so far is trying to do prototypes to showcase how it would look, how it works. But in the end, what we need is the experts of each subsystem to understand the code really and, and how Rust works to say, hey, this is actually matching my expectation on the on the seaside and how the lifetimes work on the seaside. If they don't understand Rust, it does not, it's not going to work really well. If uh, we write abstractions, we are for sure going to miss something unless we have like a long chat, like a Sahilina had with the DRM people uh, chatting, oh, okay, see, this works like I expect, this doesn't. This. So in the end, uh, as we have been saying, and, and, and we have never said otherwise. Uh, uh, some people tell us, oh, but you are going to have issues with this. No, no, we have said, all the time, if this is going to work, we need the experts to know Rust. And there is no way around it. And I don't want to hide that fact. Like, if, if you have a complex system where lifetimes are complex, the relationships are complex, you really need the maintainers to tell you, okay, this is actually what, what, what we, we want. Because in the end, what you are encoding is extra things that C cannot encode in, type, in, in types, in signatures. What you are doing is encoding that knowledge into, into, into those. Uh, and that's what, what we need somebody to tell us, hey, what you have encoded is actually what is, is the reality, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, to echo that a little bit as, you know, a maintainer of a subsystem with a very small amount of uh, Rust bindings and that in it, uh, with KUnit, um, the way there, because I'm not going to pretend to know even anything more than the very slightest amount of Rust doing mm -hmm. that, um, is, you know, it's, it's difficult to learn Rust while you're busy doing maintainership stuff. Um, the kernel is not the easiest place to learn Rust because, you know, uh, the sorts of things you want to do in the kernel, and particularly as we're talking about writing abstractions, which is one of the hardest things to do correctly, um, are not typical beginner Rust things. And you go out and look at upstream, you know, external Rust documentation, and you know, every time you try to look up how to do something you need to do in the kernel, the response is, don't do that. You only need to do that if you're doing something crazy like working on a kernel. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, one, you know, it will be great to improve the amount of documentation that, that we have that is how to learn Rust and kernel, you know, Linux kernel focused. Um, I think we're, we're starting with that and we're going to get there. Um, two, you know, we have lots of people, you know, in the Rust community who are prepared to help out as, you know, co-maintainers, you know, to accept, hey, I'm reviewing something with some scary abstractions in my subsystem. As a Rust expert, can you have another look over that? And three, 
if the bindings, if it's not perfectly safe the first time we accept it, I don't think we should block waiting for every binding to be absolutely perfect. We can send another patch out to fix a safety issue um, if it comes out. Let's not make that something that we totally stop everything for. No, like, I think we're right in that. Like, I'm willing to let people make mistakes. It's fine. Like, everyone makes mistakes. We're going to have to make mistakes. It's not going to go forward otherwise. But yeah, like one bit of feedback I did get from one of my maintainers recently about it was his worry was, and this I don't know how, how is that he would start writing Rust like C. <laughs> yeah, you know, he would end up with a lot. And I think you're know, doing the abstractions and then we do these small like 200 and 400 line drivers. So when we get to the 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 line drivers, you're getting that Rust you know, writing Rust as Rust instead of just writing C in Rust and getting that mindset changed. And I think, again, yeah, it'd be useful to have some resources around, is this Rust type, you know, or should I be thinking more about objects and, you know, things like that. Definitely. And, and we have been a bit, not trying to reach perfection because that's not that good. We have been trying in the first abstractions uh, and the first uh, thing that we have a stream, we have been trying to be slow and cautious and try to set a good example. And for example, things like you are mentioning, you know, we, one thing that we do, and this uh, relates to, to something that were, uh, was discussed uh, before in, in, in the, John's talk in the documentation is documentation. Take documentation, for example. We are requesting for Rust code that things are documented and th things have examples, examples that are compiled and tested as K-unit tests, uh, thanks to, uh, 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 <laughs> thanks to the K-unit guy that, that, that accepted that uh, doc test, uh, Framework. Now, what I'm trying to say is that we have some stricter rules for Rust code, and we would like that those applies, that apply to all the kernel. And we are trying to say, hey, let's be a bit more strict. Not, we don't need to be perfect, but let's, let's try to start, set an example. Uh, so the first maintainers, we hope that they, they, they try to follow the, the things that we have been working on the last years and, and try to follow that example, because I think it's the way to basically get everybody else to see how to write that Rust code. Oh, the Rust code has to be documented. It has to follow the same style. It has to, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, oh, the you, you shouldn't write unsafe code for no reason. You have to put all the safety comments there. Uh, you know, all these things that we have, not rules, but, well, some of them are rules, or we want them to make be hard rules, like don't submit something that isn't documented and the compiler will complain. You don't document it. But even if, you know, there is, there is a set of things we want to improve over C, if possible, right? And we know sometimes maintainers have told us, <laughs> they are closing on us, <laughs> they are looking at us. So some, some, some maintainers told us, well, you know, this is too much maybe. Okay, like, like no way, we, we, we don't really do, uh, we cannot do things this way. It's not that we want to force everybody to do it that way. What we want is that we are cautious in the beginning and we set an example so that others can, because the best way to learn is to see what has been done before. The first thing you do is go, oh, let's check what the other the others did, right? So we need the very first ones that we get the kernel to be as as proper, if you will, as possible and as uh, perfect as possible. Of course, we don't want to reach perfection, and we know we need to be practical and we need to go forward. Uh, and if there is a soundness issue, safety issue, that uh, we should, yeah, it's, it's not the end of the world. Uh, in fact, some of the soundness issues, even if some safety comment is wrong, and there is a way to sneak some safe rust. In C, that's all functions, basically. So, so I mean, it's a still some issue that may not, you may not have any caller in a user that is actually uh, uh, having an undefined behavior and as memory is the issue. So it's like this extra layer that we are talking about all the time about. This extra layer is what is really worth about Rust. And that's why we want to get that extra layer to be really, basically to get it into the minds of the developers and, and maintainers that we really need to preserve that. We, we need to avoid putting code. What we want is that the key point is, don't put, if you know there is a soundness hole, please don't merge the code. Even if nobody is triggering the, 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 the undefined behavior through there, but please fix it before putting it in, because that's the layer of protect, protection that Rust gives you. Um, and to the point that we want to backport even soundness hole issues uh, to a stable kernels. You see, even if nobody has an issue, and the stable kernel rules say, hey, it has to be a real issue. Even if it is a, not an issue because no caller is doing it, we still want to try to backport all those fixes uh, into a stable because, you know, somebody maybe out of three. So we, we want to really make the point that these things need to be fixed. Like they are really uh, issues even if uh, they are not three. So yeah, I think we can maybe use this to our advantage um, just to make overall things better. When you're, when you're writing Rust abstractions, there's a lot of areas where it is very tricky and come to the list and say, hey, 
this doesn't make sense. Please write documentation because I do not understand how this interface is supposed to work because I know that the code is the documentation, but there's a lot of cases where it's just un incomprehensible. And if we can make that better in C and in the documentation, then that makes your lives easier, it makes our lives easier, and then we all understand what's going on. So if, that, if that's good motivation to improve our documentation, then I think we should go for it. So I haven't written any Rust code yet, but I'm very interested in exploring Rust. So one thing I have a question regarding this unsafe code. So would writing more unit tests around the unsafe code would help in catching this safety issue, like safety comment that we are writing around the unsafe code? It can help in the sense that, for example, if you trigger an assertion, you trigger a, you know, a debug assertion, you trigger, a, or it just breaks, you know, uh, you, it can help. But what I would uh, uh, say is that uh, for at least, I think, unless you have a very thorough testing uh, uh, thing, and even in the case, you may still, because not, you may not have any color even in the test that exploits any different behavior, but attackers or, or hackers that are going to try to find those, Maybe they uh, 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 they find uh, a way through the through things that you have. I don't know. Uh, well, just to clarify, what I mean is that you may not have colors. If you don't have any colors, that is triggering the issue. You don't have any vulnerability. Okay, but still, uh, um, uh, I think I think for fixing those things, uh, we could have something like uh, you know uh, UbiSand, something like that uh, that is MIRI for for Rust. And we ideally we could be running our tests under that. Uh, to, to be able to catch these, these things as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a, a matter of, it has to be an expert that knows uh, what are the lifetimes and what are the, the, how the objects behave. Um, yeah, I don't think, it, the documentation helps in the sense that it helps people to think about it and say, hey, no, no, this is, this is not, it's not the way it is. If you don't have any other talks, I think it's easier to just slip through. Uh, if you just merge code, and, yeah. that's why we put a book in the docs. The, yeah, just one thing on this topic, along with documentation, I think it would help to improve the debuggability of the Rust code, let's say, for example, I don't know, there's a kernel loops, kernel panic, there's a trace, you know, the Rust functions have all the mangling, and it's, for me, it's quite difficult, like, to see from the trace and get back to the code. Another thing is, like, in C, I have access to a wide variety of tools like let's say BPF trace or other in kernel sanitizer and whatnot. That's something that like like you know if there are plans on supporting these tools, I think you know it will help a lot. We are we are over time. Uh, we have to close. There was a question about if you can provide maybe in the slides uh, oh, yeah. the correct code for that snippet. Okay, I it would be nice. it, so I yeah. Thank you everybody for coming to us and see. <laughs>